Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. It is a good morning. It's a beautiful, holy instant. It's Carmelita. <laughs> she was saying good morning as well. I'm so happy to be back. It's so good to see all of you and all of you. And a lot has happened in the last week since I left, but we are still together. We are still one. We are still vibrating at the highest possible frequency. So thank you for that. And we're going to dive right in because we have a lot to share. In fact, before I say anything about that, let's go ahead and we're going to join in the um, our daily affirmation. So one moment. Hey, Chet, would you do me a favor and go up and the, the leash is right there. Just thank you. Perfect. Okay, here we go. Join me in this and really feel it. Don't let these be just words. Let this be the proclamation of your reality, the truth of who you are. Here we go. I am as God created me. If I remain as God created me, fear has no meaning. Evil is not real and misery and death do not exist. I am as God created me. Fear has no meaning. Evil is not real. Misery and death do not exist. If I am as God created me, if I remain as God created me, now, I can acknowledge that or I can deny that. It's up to me. If I acknowledge that and live fully within that experience, something awakens in me every moment. Something is stirred within me, and I'm able to bring that into my everyday experience. Or I can deny it and seem to have all sorts of experiences seem to be ruled by fear, seem to be ruled by death and decay and all of these things. But is that true? Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do to explore that. So there is a, a teacher that you've heard me and Vicky and others referred to many times, who was such a beautiful, brilliant light of this experience, someone who lived within the direct experience of what we're describing, back in, it was expressing it back in the 50s. So this is before many of the things that we now use, of course, miracles and others, before they ever came into existence. And he was speaking from his direct experience. And that was Joel Goldsmith. And Joel Goldsmith, his most famous book is called The Infinite Way. His whole organization was called The Infinite Way. And so I decided that just to give us a framework for our lessons for the next, I don't know, 15 or 20 days or so, I'm going to take a chapter every single day from The Infinite Way, and we'll just share a paragraph or two and open that up, open up the experience that Joel had that he shared so brilliantly with so many back in the 50s and 60s, and which he's sharing with us right now, because of course it's happening right now. It's the only time this could be happening. And the experience that he had right now, isn't that interesting? The experience that he had right now mm -hmm. is your experience. Whether you want to acknowledge that, that's your choice. But it is your experience, because this is the only experience that is real, that is true. Every other experience that, that we claim, or at least try to make real, if it does not come into alignment with reality, what? It's, it's just phase like the morning mist. It seems to be here. It seems to have a hold on us, like that beautiful prayer we just read. If I remain as God created me, fear has no meaning. Evil and death do not exist. So we're going to begin by proclaiming that we are 
as we were created, whole, perfect, and complete. And I want Joel to guide us into the experience where he begins, which is getting us to see that every problem that we've ever had comes from the belief in two. The belief in two. He would say in two worlds. The world of our everyday lives and this world that we believe that we're moving toward, that if we're good, one day we'll die and we'll end up in this new world that we might call heaven or other things. But what he says is that the belief in two worlds is the beginning of every error. And it's coming back into the experience of singularity that our salvation lies. So I just want to read to begin a paragraph from chapter one of the infinite way. And then we have a few others after that. But let's begin here. Joel says, all the error that has existed down the ages is founded on the theory or the belief in two worlds. One, the heavenly kingdom or the spiritual life, and the other a material world or mortal existence, each separate from the other. So herein lies our belief in separation. From the very beginning, the very foundation is that there are two worlds and I can only be in one. I can't be in one. Did you hear that? I need to make a choice between these two worlds either be here in my body where I'm going to be suffering and all sorts of things might and could and probably will happen to me, or I can ultimately ascend into this heavenly experience, but I can't be in one of them. I mean, I have to be in one, but I can't be in one, at one, the atonement. So Joe starts right off with this arrow, right to the center of the problem itself, the belief in two worlds. But then he goes on to talk about how the, the solution that we're looking for or that we're seeking cannot be found here in separation. Now, we often will say that uh, the world is not real. Uh, the, the choices that we're making in this world are not real choices. And it's really, it's not the earth that we're speaking of as much as it is the experience that we have based upon what we perceive to be happening to us. Because I can perceive one thing in one way and Bethel will perceive it in a completely different way. Something terrible and tragic might be happening to me and Bethel may see it as a great blessing, a transformation. So it's not the world, but it's the world. Okay, so this is what Joel has to say about that. While we strive and struggle and contend with the so-called powers of this world, combating sickness and sin or lack, spiritual sense reveals, and here it is, my kingdom is not of this world. Spiritual sense reveals that my kingdom, my home, my reality, is not here of the world of separation. Only as we transcend the desire to improve our humanhood do we understand this vital statement or come into the experience of this vital statement. When, however, we leave the realm of human betterment, trying to make things in the world better, when we leave that behind, we catch the first glimpse of the meaning of, I have overcome the world. These are all things that Jesus said 2,000 years ago, I have overcome the world. The question is, are we able to say that? I have overcome the world of separation. I have lifted above all of these limitations. And that's why we began with the prayer that we started with, I am as God created me. And if I remain as God created me, fear has no meaning. None of these things mean anything, but that can only be true if I truly am as I was created. We lift above the world. We're not trying to make the world a better place. We're realizing, as Jesus said 2,000 years ago, I have overcome the world. 
We have not overcome the world while we are seeking to have less of the world's pains and more of the world's pleasures and profits. And if we are not overcoming the sense of struggle over worldly affairs, we are not entering into the realm of heavenly affairs. So Joel's making it very clear. We have a choice. Do you want to be here trying to move the puzzle pieces around or even, I guess we could say, moving the uh, furniture around the Titanic? Has it ever gotten us anywhere? Has it ever gotten us what we really truly want or deserve? Because even in the best of situations, we're still moving through this realm of separation, of sickness, pain, and death. And what Joel is saying here is that we have a choice. We can stay in that experience, and it's fine, because this is a required course. Only the time that you take it is voluntary. You're going to have to do it sooner or later. So the question is, why not now? Why not right now? So... With every great spiritual teacher who is in the true experience of this, any of them, all of them are going to be saying the same thing, that we have to turn our back on that world of separation that we cling to. We have to, in some ways, deny it or even reject. And what Joel's going to talk about in this next paragraph, we're still in chapter one, but in the next paragraph, he talks about rejecting the love of the world, the attachment to form. Because it's really the attachment more than anything, isn't it? Because obviously, if I'm interacting with any of you or any of you or in a situation, I am called to be love itself. I'm always called to be love itself. Not to, if, if, if someone were to come to me, if Michael came to me and needed some support, I'm not going to say, I reject you because you are of this world. Of course not. I give my love in every moment. But there is an energy of seeking only that which is truly given to me by God. And that's what Joel is going to talk about. He says, love not the world, nor, nor the things of this world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's what Jesus said. Let me read that one more time. <clears throat> Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any person love the world, the love of the Father is not in them. And then Joel goes on to say, does this sound as if we're becoming aesthetics? Do we appear now to be desiring a life apart from the normal, joyous, successful walks? <laughs> of life, do not be deceived. Only those who have learned to keep their attention on spiritual things have tasted the full joys of home, companionship, and successful enterprise. This is a key point, by the way. Let me read that one more time. Only those who have learned to keep their attention, their focus on the spiritual realm only they have tasted all the full joys of being here right now. That's how you experience the full joy of everything here right now. The full joy of home, companionship, and successful enterprise. That's how you do it, by literally turning your back on the attachment to the world. Only those who have, in some measure, become centered in God have found safety, security, and peace right here in the midst of a war-torn world. So yeah. now he's going to talk about how spirit dissolves all of that. Someone has gotten unmuted here. There we go. Joel says, when confronted with any human problem, instead of laboring for an improved human condition, turn from the picture. Turn from what it looks like and realize the presence of the divine. Realize the presence of the divine in you, in you. Turn toward the presence of the divine in you. This spirit dissolves the human seeming. 
I love that, the human seeming, what seems to be, and reveals spiritual harmony, though to sight this harmony will appear as improved health or wealth or anything else. That's what it will seem to be, but those are just the byproducts. It's the internal experience of unshakable harmony. That sounds nice, doesn't it? Unshakable harmony. Isn't that something that we would all desire? To know that our sense of peace, the harmony within our lives is unshakable, that there's nothing that could happen to us that moves us from that harmonic being. This is basically all Joel is talking about, harmonic being. And when we choose the things that are of one world, as opposed to always trying to get out of this world into the next world, when we realize there is but one, those things come easily and naturally. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Well, I know one person who can illustrated even better than me. She doesn't need to have notes or a phone with quotes or anything. And that is Vicki. So Vicki, we're gonna turn to you now. And I know that you love Joel as much as anyone. In fact, as much of a, uh, an aficionado of A Course in Miracles as Vicki is, her sister Noreen is probably the world's greatest authority on Joel Goldsmith. Maybe one of these days we'll talk Noreen in the coming. In fact, Vicki, if, if you tell her that we're spending like almost a month on Joel Goldsmith, maybe she, we could talk her into it. So good morning, <laughs> Vicki. Good morning, Brother James. Good morning, everybody. It's so nice to see everybody. And I love that we're going to spend a month on Joel. You know, Joel Goldsmith's message has power because Joel was the message. He lived exactly these words. So that's why in his presence, many were able to entrain into, into the presence of God and the presence of God's love. And from, you know, yesterday's workbook lesson, today's lesson, I choose happiness, I choose love, I choose. It's all about the choice we make, but it isn't in the big things. And we say this over and over, and I always say it over and over. It's in the thought one by one. That's why the Course in Miracles is a training in mindfulness, how to keep my eye single, how to keep our eye, our heart's attention on the love of God, however we understand it. And then as a byproduct, like you said, James, whatever is about to happen, whatever grace pours through us, we're led into a natural harmony in our lives, in each other's lives, we bring that to one another. That's how we step into literally what Jesus calls the circle of atonement. When we live as a child of God, we are children of a heavenly king, of a God that loves us, that created us in love. When we live in that one identity, then everything else is given to us through the grace of that. And it only depends on our choice to hold our attention there. <clears throat> yesterday's, uh, I think it was yesterday's workbook lesson was great because all over the place, Jesus sums up forgiveness in one way or another. And Joel will do it as well. And the key he said yesterday was when something arises, something comes up, a problem, an upset, simply step back, that step back from the ego's you know, response of fight or flight, step back look at the thoughts coming, the situation, whatever it brings up, and let it go. <clears throat> there's nowhere ever in the course, there's this long process of forgiveness, this long process of undoing. What it does show us is that there seems to be a long process of throwing things out the window. I was with Mary Wonderful the other day, and that was her summation of forgiveness. You know, <laughs> you've got to look at something and throw it out the window forget about it pay it no mind but pay all our mind to the love of god only this instant and then the trick is and i catch myself every day when the conversation in my own mind or with another brother or sister 
goes to anything. Oh, I wonder what I'll do when I get home. I wonder what's going to happen here. Uh, I better check this. When, when my mind jumps into any past or future situation when I'm not prompted, that's not to say we are not prompted to, to share maybe something of the past or an experience that may be happening within us. But that's by the prompt of grace, when our attention is still on the love of God, not by response of fear, protection, defending ourselves. That's the difference. So in its every instant, watch, I watch my mind when I wake up, what's on my mind? What thought was on my mind? And I catch it and I say, no, I don't have to worry about bus um, schedules or, or plane schedules or the rest of it. My mind is, here I am, here I am, dear God. For me, it's Jesus. I trust in you. And Teddy taught me this too. Father, thy will be done. He kept his mind there. However, it works for each of us. You know, there are words that, that stir us. Each one of us are images that stir us, that open our hearts, that give us that um, direct experience of being loved. Whatever they are, use them. And don't let, I'm really as vigilant as I know how to be. Because I, you know, Jesus says the world is weary and tired and it is up to us to bring peace to what seems like a seeming world of upset. And it really only depends on our instant to instant choice of where, for me, where do I put my attention? Let my eye be single on the love of God. And, and then every situation is just an opportunity to share that love and to see that that's the only thing that operates in us. The other thing that's operating is just seeming fear. It's good that he used the word seeming. Joel, in all of his teachings, and it's amazing that he has such an accumulation of books, and James, you're right, Noreen has every one of those books, letters, and tapes. But in every one of them, it all boils down to come into the experience of our Father's love. Come into the experience right now, right now, with Baraka's clock, right now, right now, and not let ourselves get away with slippery thinking. Slippery thinking is, oh, I wonder this, or oh, that's too bad about that. Slippery thinking right now, right now, dear God, thank you that, that I am your child. You know, claiming only that identity, that, but every instant not just in the big traumas. And the big traumas are a wonderful wake up call because when we shift our attention, because we're in a trauma, it helps us realize the value of being in, in having our attention on spirit. But the real key is having our attention all day long, all day long, and let it be a party of grace all day long. That's why it's wonder and welcome rather than worry and, and you know, figuring things out and protecting. So I love we're going to do Joel. Joel did one thing um, when his, he had a, a stepson, his, his adopted son was going off to college and he had grown up with Joel and he wanted to reduce everything into one short message that he would retain. And he wrote a short thing called a uh, letter to Sam. And Sam was his son. And he said, if you don't remember any of this thing, any of these things that you've grown up with, just remember, put your attention on the love of God. Come into that presence of love. And then as a byproduct, everything else will flow from that in grace. So you can look it up, a letter to Sam. So, okay, James, I'm going to do my homework and pull out Infinite Way and get ready for a wondrous week of Joel. What, what a great hearty example. He was so himself, nothing less than full body um, attention on the love of God in himself. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Vicki. As always, wonder and welcome. The two W's. I love that. If we could just live in that wonder and the wonderful experience, welcoming everything, literally everything, knowing that everything is either for our experience of heaven or our welcome into heaven. Everything is here to help us come into that direct experience. 
And yet everything that we're hearing, everything Vicky shared or that Joel is sharing, you could very, very easily say is very unreasonable. It's unreasonable to the intellectual mind to believe that there's only one world, for example to believe that there's only one thing going on. Now, many of us have come to the point where the truth is becoming very reasonable, right, Ravi? It's like we're suddenly seeing the truth and it feels right. It's a reasonable truth. But especially in the beginning, the ego will rebel and it will seem very unreasonable. In fact, what I have always said and what Joel says as well is beware of any truth that seems reasonable because it's probably not the truth. And I want to read one final little bit here from chapter one in the infinite way where Joel addresses this. He says, how frequently do we attempt to understand spiritual wisdom with the human intellect? This leads to mental indigestion <laughs> because we are attempting to digest spiritual food with our educated mentality. It will not work. Truth is not a reasoning process. Therefore, it must be spiritually discerned. You have to feel it, not think it. You need to feel it. Truth does not, as a rule, appeal to our reason. And when it does appear to do so, we must search deeply to see if it really is the truth. Be suspicious of a truth that seems reasonable. Very good advice. So live in the unreasonable expression and experience of love every moment, even when it feels totally unreasonable. There will always be times in our lives where people will say, that's not a reasonable response to love. But we have come into the direct experience of that love now, and we know that it's the only reasonable response to every situation, to every moment, love no matter what. So I'm really happy to begin here with this expression of what Joel shared way back. Well, it wasn't that long ago, but for, for you, some of you were still in the 50s. I wasn't, but... <laughs> He says with glee. <laughs> All right, let's take a deep breath. And seek that presence now. Just see if you can breathe into this holy instant. Where this unreasonable truth comes alive within us. And we welcome it. We experience the wonder of this holy instant. And we say thank you. Thank you for opening our eyes and our hearts, opening our minds to know that only love is real. Only love is real. So now, as we go forth into our day, we allow this light to shine even brighter, even grander. We recognize that God is so reasonable, love is so reasonable. I was trying to bring up a song, but it's, oh, here we go. Okay. So God is so reasonable. Let's feel that now as we share a final song. And if you know it, please sing along. Oh God, you are so wonderful. Oh God, you are so wonderful. You are wonderful to me. Oh God, you are so wonderful, you are wonderful to me. Oh God, you are so wonderful, 
you were wonderful to me. You are wonderful to me. And we are so grateful. And we are so blessed. Amen. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for getting the week started off in such a powerful, beautiful way. We love you all. Namaste to all of you. And we'll see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye. Happy Monday. Thank you. I love you all.